Um, the our presenter of our main talk today is uh, well known to this community. In fact, he was here as our musician last week. And I think this might be the first time where we had someone play one week and speak the next. So another first for our community. He is a uh, Houston music legend. You can hear him frequently on his, his music on KPFT. I hear that from time to time. He's uh, uh, led the songwriter circle at uh, Anderson Fair for like 18 years and just an all around wonderful human being. We're so glad he can be here today. And his topic today is living a creative life. Let's give a welcome to Ken Gee. Here's a short monologue from uh, Jules Pfeiffer's stage play, Pfeiffer's People. It's entitled Artist. I'm an artist but it's not what I really want to be. What I really want to do is be a, a shoe salesman. Oh, I know what you're going to say, dreamer. Get your head out of the clouds, all right. <laughs> but it's what I want to be. Instead, I have to go on all day long painting. The world should make a place for a shoe salesman. Jules Pfeiffer. In reality, I'm not an artist, nor a shoe salesman. I'm a singer-songwriter, and it's exactly what I want to be. And when people tell me I'm lucky to be living such a creative life, I agree with them. I am lucky. I am intentionally lucky. That word, intention, is one of my favorites. It means making deliberate choices on how to spend time. And one of my least favorite words is talent. When people tell me how talented I am, I'm polite, but given the chance, I let it be known in my opinion, talent is overrated. I believe I have four, I just made up another one, four talents relevant to my work. <laughs> I could carry a tune, I think that's a talent. I'm a good driver. I need that in my profession. I'm a good sleeper. I can sleep anywhere and at any time. And out on the road, that's precious. And I am one stubborn son of a gun. And I come from a long line of stubborn SOGs. And those are the sum total of my talents. Every other aspect of what I do has come dearly with hard work and frustration. It's a life of financial insecurity, and I wouldn't recommend it to anyone. But it's been worth every second. When you hear a song of mine, please know that I've thrown away or abandoned many more songs than I will ever let you hear. And in performing it before anything else, or before anyone else, except maybe my wife, before they hear it, I've already sung it hundreds of times to the walls of my house or the trees in my yard. Developing myself as a writer, singer, guitar player, live performer, promoter, booking agent, and bus driver has been the work of a lifetime. And I have the aches, the calluses, the scars, the stories, the failures, and the joys of that development. And with a few notable exceptions, I wouldn't have done it any other way. I don't expect any of you, except for a few of you, <laughs> to become professional singer-songwriters. I don't advise it, unless you simply have to, and you're willing to pay the price. But we can all live joyous, creative lives without being involved in so-called fine arts as a living. Being creative means involving ourselves and in making intentional choices about how we spend our time. It's a process of empowerment. Our lives are complicated enough with so much of that time taken up with what we have to do, being responsible to our loved ones and society. And it's so much easier to cover the bases, do our duty, and then kick back and relax when we get the chance without involving ourselves creatively. It's easier, as opposed to intentionally in our day-to-day -day activities, 
jobs, relaxation, and relationships. With that in mind, I've developed an ever-expanding list of rules to live by creatively, whether you're an artist, a scientist, a cabinet maker, a preacher, a shoe salesman, or a spouse and parent. And I call them the Ten Suggestions. <laughs> Number one, thou shalt turn off the damn TV. <laughs> Without a doubt, television has some fascinating programming, but watching television is passive. We can choose the channel and program, but that's where our choices end. And watching television is being fed a mix of information in a very calculated manner with the primary aim of making us buy or buy into something. Commercials are the most honest part of the whole thing. <laughs> but neither the commercials nor the programs offer the chance to join the conversation and ask questions. The only other choice we have is to turn it off, and I swear by it. Number two. This is the shortened version of all this, by the way. <laughs> Number two, thou shalt make the time. Notice I didn't say take the time. That indicates stealing it from something else you would otherwise be doing. Make the time. Give it to yourself. Ben Franklin wrote in Poor Richard's Almanac, time is money, and we live by that dictum in our society. Ben is one of my heroes, but I disagree. Money is money. An arbitrarily agreed upon medium of exchange for goods and services, and that in and of itself is power enough. Time is something infinitely more precious. If any of us were to calculate the hourly wage of developing ourselves as critically thinking and actively creative beings, it would, in most cases, give us a poor run of the a rate of return, monetarily. <laughs> One of the realities of my profession is long, uninterrupted hours by myself in an automobile. And I look at it as one of the gifts that allows me time, precious time, to think. But thinking while driving has its limitations. <laughs> I have to stay in the proper lane and in the proper direction. So I've developed excuses that give me time to go deeper into my thoughts. When performing, I like to arrive early when I can to warm up and think. It's often one of the most creative little spaces of time I get. I'm, I was rewriting this as I was sitting there, as you were all coming in. Everywhere I live, I build a fire pit. I build cool fire pits <laughs> at which I sit and play guitar or just wonder while tending the fire. And I have a beat up old camper, it's my festival home, and sometimes I just take it out somewhere and, or set it up in the yard. And sometimes I sit and thinks, and sometimes I just sit. <laughs> it's an old joke, but it illustrates the point. In a world where I have to constantly keep myself booked, promoted, and networked with others, I've learned I have to book the time to think. Book the time to write songs. Or in this case, book the time to write a talk about living creatively. <laughs> Number three, make notes. Every great creative mind you can think of has developed the habit of making, not taking, notes. Leonardo da Vinci kept a very eloquent series of notebooks with drawings and writings to work out his thoughts. I've seen those selections from those notebooks in the Queen's collection, and they're an incredible window into the workings of an incredible mind, especially after it was discovered how to read them by looking at them in the mirror. As an art student, I intentionally mimicked him. It's one of my old notebooks as an art student. 
it's fun to go back. As a songwriter, the form changed into a series of developing pages, printed out, scratched on, reprinted, and it becomes a little book of a song, layer upon layer upon layer. The very act of making notes reinforces the thought. It is literally thinking twice at once and rereading those notes, rethinking them. Number four, work from the whole to the part. Every completed work, whether a building, a plumbing project, or a song has a form, a structure, that stands and provides a framework for its intended purpose. A building encloses and protects a home or a profession, and often gives at first sight a hint of its purpose. Plumbing's a two-way street. One side is under pressure and can defy gravity. The other has to run downhill. <laughs> and it needs to stay out of the way of every other part of the building and protect everything else from what's inside. And the sooner the builder or the plumber visualizes the entire form of their project, the more successful they are at assembling the pieces. And if those pieces, one of those pieces doesn't fit, find the one that does. And a song is no different. The quicker the structure or outline is conceived, the more successful the songwriter is, it is in assembling the parts. And just like buildings, there are already existing successful forms that need to be studied. But once that form is established, the creative choices are endless. Number five, put everything down with the intention of changing it. I heard this almost daily when I was in art school, but it was truly brought home to me once again by looking at Da Vinci's drawings. And then you can see him physically drawing, searching lines for exactly the right one for a profile or, or a building or a horse. And you see him finally finding it, then he would emphasize it. Surely if a mind as keen as Leonardo's needed to draw a number of lines to find the right one, the rest of us would need to do so as well. Intentionally working that way, we learn that each line in a drawing, each word in a lyric, each note in a melody, each chord in a progression is not to be considered sacred or set in stone. If it does not support the whole song, it needs to be removed and replaced. That's a tough habit to come by, but it's essential. And it's good to know that sometimes a great line can be used in another song. This practice can be applied creatively to our jobs, our relationships, our opinions and attitudes, our entire life. In the case of our lives, they're going to be changed for us anyway, constantly, by precious time. And this skill develops flexibility in our nature. Thoreau said, a foolish consistency is the product of small minds. Which brings us to number six. <clears throat> Your mind has a mind of its own. <laughs> One of the skills a creative mind learns is to listen to itself. Science has given us vague insights into the layers of conscious and unconscious thought, waking thought, dreams. Cultures we call primitive make little or no distinction, considering each is another form of reality as valid as the stones and trees around them. Today, we live in a physical reality of noise, constant, deafening noise mind-numbing noise. And it's not just the roar of the traffic and the crowd. How many indoor spaces can you walk into without hearing music or being confronted by a television on the wall? How many homes? One of our evolutionary adapt adaptations has to be the development of a heavy-duty filter to block out the noise in order for us to function. And it's my belief 
that that successful development of those filters that keep out the noise from without are often equally successful at keeping out the noise from within. As I've developed as a musician, I've come to realize when I stop and listen, my life has a constant soundtrack. The silence from without is golden. I once drove five hours with my dad in my van, listening to the music, until finally he asked me if I could turn on the radio or put something on the CD. <laughs> and I was shocked. And then I laughed and pulled out one of the CDs I bought, brought along especially for him. And I told him, I'm sorry, Dad, my, my radio is always on, except I'm the only one who hears it. <laughs> Making the silent time around my fire pit or my camper has helped develop that ability. And here's another tool I've come to appreciate and develop. Making the time to wake up slowly. In that magical creative space between dreaming and full waking consciousness, I've worked out some of my toughest writing problems. Inside my mind with a mind of its own. Number seven. Take out the trash. <laughs> How many useless things do we hang on to, carrying them around with us for years? I once burned the first four to five hundred songs I had written and carried around with me for decades across oceans and continents. So I realized how far beyond them I'd progressed. So I burned them in a little ritual campfire while <laughs> winter camping in the Colorado Rockies. And it was one of the most freeing experiences I'd had up to that point, watching the smoke of them curl up into the cold, clear mountain air. That realization helped develop a lifetime habit of re-examining songs, attitudes, possessions, even friendships, and letting them go. Sometimes with reluctance and fear. On rare occasions, something or someone has come back to me unbidden with a fresh value, and that too is part of the process. Ultimately, regularly and intentionally, taking out the trash frees up time and space for living more creatively. All that extra baggage, we call it. Take out the trash. Number eight. Who's your hero? This is another one drilled into me in art school. The notion of not wanting to have our own perfect original spirit polluted by copying the ideas of others is devoid of all practical sense. If in the process of our work, we have anything truly original to say, it will come out and nothing will be able to stop it. And in every field of thought, we stand on the shoulders of giants. And each of those giants had heroes of their own. Michelangelo had Donatello, Shakespeare had Marlowe, Mozart had the Box and Martini, Einstein had Ernst Mach and Maxwell. Each had multiple heroes that they studied intensively, intentionally, and all became their own particular genius. Mine are Paul Simon and Paul McCartney. Jack Williams, Caroline Aiken, Marina Rocks, Duke Ellington, John Lennon, Johnny Mercer, and a whole lot more. Intentionally choosing and studying heroes creates that balance of inspiration, the taking in and distillation of information, and exhalation, the released expression of what we learned so far. And maybe, just a touch, or maybe a whole new world of your own, not quite so perfect original spirit. Number nine, don't forget your child. This isn't about, about leaving your kid out in the parking lot in the car. <laughs> in the front yard of the house on 1663, Pringle Circle, there's a huge live oak tree. And if you look closely, closely, you'll see a bulge right where the first tree branches branch off. 
1962, after my parents bought it and we moved in, I placed a brick in the fork of those first branches of that then not quite so large oak tree as a handhold and stepping stone so I could climb up into the tree. And over the years, the tree grew over it. But it's still in there. And I'm the only one who knows exactly where. And just like that 11, just like that 11 year old little kid is still inside this 64 year old me. You wanna know where this writing thing came from? In second grade, Mrs. Harper had us write a story using all of the spelling words for that week. I had a good time with that story. And when I got it back along with the grade, she wrote, Kenneth, you're quite the writer. <laughs> she then wrote, Kenneth is quite the writer on my next report card. My fate was sealed. <laughs> I was a writer. Mrs. Harper said so. The stories continued. The next year, third grade, my older cousin Rodney sang Sweet Betsy from Pipe to me. I never heard it before. He told me he wrote it. <laughs> the next week, I had my own version of the song from Ike's point of view. Rodney was impressed. <laughs> Kenny, you're a songwriter. Now, this came from the kid who taught me how to spit through my teeth. Taught me not to pee on an electric fence. <laughs> Talked me into kissing Patty Tate. <laughs> Taught me the F-bomb. <laughs> so, I was a songwriter. The songs continued. The child became the man. Number 10. Say yes. Every no is driven by fear. Some of it completely justified. No, you're drunk. I'm not getting in that car with you. No way, I said to my cousin Rodney. No way I'm going to scratch the top of that little alligator's head. <laughs> but most of my sincerest regrets are when I said, no, I'm not going back to California to join a rock band with my best friends. I'm going to stay right here in Mississippi and marry this beautiful young woman with whom I have nothing in common. <laughs> or, no, I'm not going to make regular trips to Nashville to pitch my songs or sign that contract with that guy actively placing music in film. Every no to a creative endeavor was based on my own laziness or feelings of inadequacy, and they were self-imposed. At 18, I was going to travel around the country in a van with my brand new Martin D28 guitar and sing songs I'd written to anyone who had listened. It took me 20 years to establish that. And I was doing just that in spite of all the obstacles that life threw in my way. And later I learned to aim higher by saying, yes, I can write songs for a children's theater. Yeah, I can write music for that movie you're working on. Yes, I can book and host a weekly songwriter series in Houston's oldest and best acoustic listening room. Every Thursday night, by the way. <laughs> sure, I can teach songwriting, performance skills, and how to eat and stay healthy on the road. MC the Texas Music Awards? Of course. <laughs> and even... Ken, would you be interested in doing a talk at one of our future gatherings at Houston Oasis? Uh, yeah. Great, what would it be about? Hmm, thinking quickly. I just did some music at the Creative Life's church in spring. Uh, how about living a creative life? Sounds great, Ken. We're looking forward to it. In each case, I had only the slightest idea about how I was going to accomplish it. But there was no drunk driver to get into an auto accident with, and no little alligator to take my fingers off. All I could do was either give it my best shot and succeed with the skills I'd spent a lifetime developing, or make a fool of myself for a brief time. I make a fool of myself almost every time I perform on one scale or another. And I learn from those mistakes and get better. And I thank you all for the opportunity to make a fool of myself today, whether 
you want to be an artist or a shoe salesman, say yes to those creative opportunities as they arrive. And they will arrive with more frequency as you develop. Jump off the cliff, build your wings on the way down. <laughs> the world doesn't have to make a place for you as a shoe salesman. You make it yourself. And in the process, you become yourself. Intentionally. Thank you very much. Any questions? Any time? Yes. You forgot to say where you post on Thursday. Okay. I, I, thank you very much. I will give you that. I'm at Anderson Fair, which is uh, Houston's oldest and best acoustic listening room. Anderson Fair it, is on Montrose, right next to Texas Art Supply. Anybody, ever, anybody have any problems with that? Okay. It is right next to Texas Art Supply on the south side of Texas Art Supply. Great place. Come on, who wants to be more creative? <laughs> Did I cover it too well? <laughs> uh, Ty. Oh, yeah, Mark. Uh, Let's get it for the... Are you in uh, accordance with something I... Something I... Um, oh, yeah. Something I tried to uh, talk about. Mike, Mike had had a uh, discussion about habits from religious uh, terms that we use it had their, I guess, um, creation in, in religious thought. And, and I pointed out that, and this is why I feel very serious about it, um, that um, music is not a gift. And, because uh, I resent people telling me I'm gifted. Because that implies that somebody gave me that ability. When you said, uh, I think you said to the fact, I don't uh, remember exactly, um, that you didn't believe in talent. That's another thing that I, I agree with you on, that uh, I tell my students and other people that talent is like 98% desire, 2% innate ability. Because I'm not born with those things. I had to work really hard to develop my craft, just yeah. as you did yours. Yeah. And so my point is, and I still, even in spite of the fact that I made that point, I still hear people uh, telling me I'm gifted. And, and I, it's very resented. Uh, on my part, because I worked very hard to get one. Get it. So I wanted to be in accordance with that. Yeah, I'm, I'm in, in complete accordance. I'm, I'm a polite person uh, by nature. That's what my mama taught me to be. And uh, I, I, I try not to, you know, jump in people's faces because when someone tells me I'm talented, I'm gifted, they're complimenting me on what they just heard, and I appreciate that. I know that. Um, you talk about religion, okay? Now, religion did give me something. Okay, I'm, I'm a recovering Catholic. <laughs> and the form, the form I grew up with every Sunday at the Mass, which, by the way, this gathering here is based on, okay, that form, that structure, gave me the ideas of how things have their pieces and fit together to become effective. And I'll tell you what, I still love to go and watch a good Mass. A real good Mass is just a yeah, you know, it's beautiful. It's beautiful to watch, especially if the music is, is in tune. It's gorgeous. <laughs> it's gorgeous because of all that form that has been developed over the years. So I grew up with that, and I, and I credit that in, in my work of having that idea of form. Oh. Yes? Yes, uh, Does living creatively require an audience? Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't really have a good answer to that. <laughs> no, I guess I guess a, a person could live on their own, and no, no, it doesn't require an audience. Doing what I do creatively requires an audience because I'm a performer. You mean to be a great musician, you need an audience? No, to be a great performer, you need an audience. To be a great musician, you could sit and 
uh, up in a cabin in Alaska and you know compose and write and uh, maybe never put it out in a form that no one ever heard before. So no, that doesn't require it. That's an audience of one. Be a performer. That's an audience of one. You're right, and you would be doing that. And oftentimes, more often than uh, being in front of an audience, I am an audience of one. But I always have that idea as I've developed as a performer. To uh, even when I'm singing to myself, I'm singing to y'all. I'm working on that. I'm working on how that's going to work and affect you. My performances. I tell people that they're 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 being lovingly manipulated <laughs> and uh, and if I can make you laugh and if I can make you cry and if I can make you think and if I can make you tap your feet all in one performance I've done my job so as a performer as a creative performer that's what I'm looking for I could sit home and write these songs all day long and, and uh, never give them to somebody and I could be creative I could build a beautiful garden which I'm doing in my home I could sit in my fire pit, it's a beautiful fire pit, and none of you would ever have to uh, be a part of it, except if you're one of my I'm Facebook not. friends. <laughs> I'm having fun. Yes? This is not very well formed, I guess, but when y'all are talking about talent, not believing maybe in talent, per se? I believe in a certain amount. Like I say, okay, I think, and I don't know whether I was born with it, or it was something that uh, uh, was developed early in my life because I grew up in a musical family that I can carry a tune, I can match notes. That's physically what that's about. But that's, that's the only talent. Taking that right there, that little seed, and developing it into someone who has been up in front of people since I was quite young, and then learning to play guitar, primarily because girls like <laughs> play guitar. But later on it became a little bit more serious, you know, it, or it branched out a little bit. Um, so it's not that I don't believe in talent, but as Mark said, you know, talent is just a small seed. And I mean, probably all of you can carry a tune. Or most of you can carry a tune. Put it that way, yes. There are a few of us who, who you know, who can't match notes for whatever reason. Um, but developing that. It's, it's hard work. I can't tell you how much, how many hours I've spent singing. I, what I was trying to, what I was thinking was telling somebody you, you have talent is, is that the opposite of telling somebody like a child you don't have talent? Oh, that's killer. That, <laughs> I would never do that. Yeah. No, yeah. Yeah, I would never do that. There's a one, one more. And then yeah, one more. Answer. Yes. You yeah. spoke about uh, the noise within and the noise without. Yeah. And I am unable to have, I can't handle the noise without. I have to have some kind of music playing at any time, except at night when I'm sleeping. Then I must have no noise whatsoever. Yeah. He can sit in the living room in complete silence and be absolutely happy, and I hear all this noise. How do I filter that down so I can sit like he does in silence? Because I'm talking, 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 and he's just looking at me like, yeah. okay, okay, okay. <laughs> How do you filter that out? Mm. How do I stop my you know, Yeah, I, I, I've never really thought about that. My wife is, is the type of person who needs just that little soundtrack going on to do her, but she's creative and she does her work with that. Now, it depends on what she's listening to musically. And she listens to a lot of uh, instrumental music and has it in a very low setting. And on top of that soundtrack, she is able to do her work. But her work isn't listening to the soundtrack with, or from within musically. So um, I think with the way you're living your life is, I mean, you've learned to filter that out um, because of the other filters. Yes, that's how you've done it. So I don't, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't see a problem with the way you're, you're, you're working as long as you're able to sit on top of that, that little foundation of, 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 of beautiful noise that puts you in that space where then your mind can, can travel. Yeah. That's why they need headphones. 
Yeah. yeah. I should have had my noise in here. Yeah. yeah. I'm, 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 of course, my, my hearing is, is, is going. I'll tell you that right now. After Why? years of, <laughs> yeah. After years of, you know, saying the rock and roll bands and working around just loud noises of all sorts, my hearing is, is, is going. Um, but, you know, I, I was a dad. I had kids. Uh, I learned to filter out noise <laughs> in order to survive, and, and, and it, uh, it's a skill that uh, has served me well. Thanks so much, Thank you.